Hey, well, yeah, if you are a veteran, I know we clapped a little bit there, but if you are a veteran, if you would stand up, because we would like to, like to recognize you today. If you're a veteran, stand up. Stand up. Hey. All right. Well, thank y'all. Thank y'all very much. Uh, I appreciate y'all doing that with me there this morning. And I tell you, you know, uh, Veterans Day, it's, it is a big deal to me because I appreciate more than I could ever say to any of y'all or uh, veterans anywhere. You know, we can never thank y'all enough for the sacrifices uh, that all soldiers have made uh, throughout all time. You know, in preparing for today, thinking about being a soldier and all, uh, I had a question on my mind that I'm going to ask uh, each one of us to think about today. Am I a soldier? And not of the Army, not of the Navy, not of the Marines or any other earthly uh, military organization, but am I a soldier of the cross? And we're going to use that for the title of the message today. Am I a soldier of the cross? Our text is going to be from 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, 2 Timothy uh, 2. And uh, hold on to your seat, but I'm not reading from the NIV today. I like the way the New King James uh, worded this section of Scripture best, so that's what we are going to use today. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and if you would, in honor of reading God's Word, let's stand and read and see what the Apostle Paul wrote here today. See what it meant to his original recipient, and see what it means to us today. And how many of y'all's Bible have these little... Uh, Subtitles or whatever. Any of y'all's got them? What does your little subtitle over chapter 2 say? Oh, that one doesn't have it. They didn't like chapter 2, huh? For some reason. Miss Sandy? The appeal renewed. What did you say, Laura? He is strong. He is strong. I just like to hear different ones. See how different. Mine says, be strong in grace. Let's see what it says. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must be, you, I'm sorry, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I'm saying, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David... He was raised from the dead according to the gospel for which I suffer trouble as an evil, evil doer, even to the point of chains. Oh, but praise God, the word of God is never chained. Almighty God, as we look at your word today, as in the back of our minds we think of our veterans that have fought in physical wars, that we may be free, that we may come and stand here today and uh, freely, without fear, proclaim your word. Lord, if it wasn't for the veteran, we wouldn't be able to do that. So for those among our midst that have served, God, I pray you would bless them. Uh, Lord, may today they just feel, a, feel a, a special urgence from your Holy Spirit. For those families that have lost loved ones in battle, uh, Veterans Day can be a bittersweet thing for them. I pray you would touch them and encourage them as only you can. But Lord, today, help us to draw from this letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. Help us to draw from it what it can mean for us today as we think about, are each one of us a good soldier of Jesus Christ? It's in his name I pray, amen. Hey, well, thank you. You can be seated. You know, the Apostle Paul, the one that wrote this, and all those that read his letters, they would have been well acquainted with the uh, concept of the military. You see, the presence of the professional soldiers in the imperial Roman army could be found in every place where the early church was located. You know, whether it was in Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, uh, shoot, even in Jerusalem and all throughout the Middle East right there, everywhere. Rome was in control 
And the way they maintained control was they strategically located soldiers all throughout the Roman Empire. Therefore, if there was any kind of uprising or whatever, boom, they were right there to put it down. So when Paul used military language to describe the Christian life, it was something that all of the early believers understood because the military, whether they were in it or around it, was a part of everyday life. Let me share with you just a few verses from the New Testament where this soldier analogy is used to refer to the Christian experience. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 25, Paul referred to his dear friend Epaphroditus. Again, I'm glad we use Sam and Bill now, but his friend Epaphroditus, he called him my fellow soldier in the Lord. Another friend Paul had, and in the second verse of Philemon, he referred to his friend Archippus also as a fellow soldier in the gospel of the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul talked about truth, faith, righteousness, uh, love, other aspects of Christianity. He referred to these things, does anybody know, as the armor of God. And Paul talked about these dis different aspects of Christianity. Each one was a part of the believer's armor in the battle that they were in with God. Matter of fact, uh, many people believe that when Paul wrote Ephesians, he was in prison, and he was probably looking at a guard standing there outside his cell, and he thought, well, that breastplate that he has on, that would be compared to righteousness. Or the helmet that he has on, that would be compared to the Word of God. So anyway, Paul was familiar with it. And one last one. In 1 Thessalonians 5.14, when Paul said, quote, to warn those who are unruly in the church, end quote, that word unruly was a military term, and it referred to a soldier who was undisciplined, who was disorderly, and in danger of, being, of getting a dishonorable discharge. So you see, friends, there are quite a few military metaphors used in the Bible uh, to describe the Christian experience. And again, the reason Paul did that over and over was because the people he wrote to would have been familiar with all of this. Hey, now, I'm sure just about all of us remember the song that we sang as a kid. You know, I may never march in the infantry, ride in the... Shoot the artillery. I may never zoom on the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. And then what would you do? Yes, sir. That's right. Yes, sir. How you know that song is more than cute, friends? It's really right. When uh, our song directors are, you know, is teaching us as kids this song, they were really ingraining in us as children that as we grow up and as we serve the Lord, that we are going to be in a battle. You know, John MacArthur, I read a lot of his stuff. He said this, quote, The Christian life is not a playground, it's a battlefield. End quote. Uh, one of my favorite preachers to listen to, J. Vernon McGee, he's in heaven now. But, <clears throat> excuse me, but he once said this, Most Christians want to ride to heaven on a cruise ship, but in reality... We're on a battleship. You know, it's true with these uh, verses we just read and what these two guys said in mind. We're just going to walk through verses 3 and 4 here and see what Paul had to say. Now, to start with, look there in your Bible, and do you have any idea who Paul wrote this to in particular? He wrote this to a certain individual. I think I already mentioned a young guy's name. Timothy. Timothy, exactly. He wrote to Timothy. Everybody say Timothy. Timothy was from the city of Lystra in Asia Minor. You don't care anything about that, but that is modern-day Turkey. So I just want you to know, when Paul wrote this letter to a young man in the faith who grew up in what today we would call modern-day Turkey. Timothy's mom, she was a, a, a Jewish lady. She came to faith in Jesus Christ. Timothy's dad was a Greek. Uh, Paul talks about that. He had a Greek dad who I don't believe ever came to faith in Jesus Christ. But it was Timothy's mother and her mom, in other words, Tim, uh, Timothy's grandma, his mom and his grandma were the ones that led Timothy to faith in Jesus Christ as a young, a young kid. Hey, so uh, you moms, grandmas, 
Remember what a great influence you are on the little ones around you. So anyway, the Apostle Paul, he met Timothy. Timothy was probably a late teenager or whatever. Paul was on his second missionary journey when he came through Timothy's hometown. He met the young lad, saw he had great prospect of becoming a gospel minister. So he took Timothy under his wing and mentored him to become a minister of the gospel. Now, in verse 1, uh, again, it's interesting. Well, the reason he doesn't say Timothy here because he says it in chapter 1. But in verse, uh, right here in chapter 2, verse 1, what did Paul call Timothy? My son. That's right, Ms. Dad. He called him my son. Uh, a lot of people read that and they say, I didn't think Paul had any kids. Well, no, he wasn't his kid physically, like I told you. He had a Jewish mom, Timothy did, and a Greek dad. No, what Paul meant by that, first of all, it was a term of endearment. It showed Timothy how much he loved Timothy. But y'all, in that day, usually whatever your daddy did for a living, that's what you were going to do as well. So you better hope you like what your daddy did, because usually what happened was the dad would teach his son the same trade. And so that's one reason why Paul called Timothy my son in the faith. Because that's what Paul did. He took Timothy under his wing and he taught him a trade, you could say. He taught him how to become a minister of the gospel. Now, as we go on in here, verse 3, uh, you see how much Paul loved this young guy, Timothy. And he called on Timothy to be a soldier, but not just a soldier, but what kind of soldier? A good soldier. Everybody say good. good. He called on Timothy to be a good soldier. Hey, you know, uh, I'm sure y'all that were in the military, y'all know this way better than me. But our armed forces have lots of people. They're nothing but a soldier. You know, they do the minimum, never go the extra mile, try to beat the system when they can. They're probably the ones that got the rest of y'all in trouble because they lagged behind, didn't do what they were supposed to do. But sadly, friends, there are a lot of Christians that are the same way. And they only go, these are the kind of Christians, they're not a good follower of Jesus Christ, they're a follower. They go to church occasionally. When they go, it's only flippantly. You know, they never commit to do much. They rarely read their Bible. They seldom ever pray. Oh yeah, they want to go to heaven all right, but they want to do as little as possible along the way. Well, y'all, friends, Paul wanted Timothy and us, not just to be a soldier of Jesus Christ, to be a good soldier. So if you want to be a good soldier of Christ today, say, I want to. I want to. Well, y'all sound like it, so I'm going to share with you three characteristics, I know you're surprised, of a good soldier. And uh, you're lucky, because I had about ten of them, uh, but I didn't know if any of you veterans were packing today, and I didn't want to keep it that long. So anyway, we're going to look at three. Friends, first of all, a good soldier is willing to endure hardship. Paul said that there in verse 3. He said, Timothy, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That word endure, it literally means strength from adversity. Strength from adversity. Hey, any of y'all, uh, I know a lot of y'all like to exercise. Any of y'all like to exercise? Hey, a lot of y'all do. You know, maybe riding a bike. Uh, any of y'all ever lift weights? Anybody ever get serious about lifting weights? Okay. Now, I know uh, it's going to surprise y'all, but there was a time where I really got into lifting weights. You know, Lance used to, my muscles went this way, now they go this way. But anyhow, I'll never forget, I was uh, 18 years old, right out of high school. I was working for a grocery store called Food Giant. Uh, I was working part-time, Brother Dennis, boss liked me, so he hired me full-time when I got out of high school. Of course, unfortunately, the hours were 11 at night, 7 in the morning. Any of y'all ever worked that shift? Uh, I hated it, hated it. But anyway, only way to work full-time. Well, there were four of us on the stock crew. We got together, and we all joined the American Fitness Center. Now you've got a fitness center on every corner in every major intersection. And that day, that was the only one in all of Stone Mountain, Georgia, and the surrounding area. So we joined that thing, Miss Pamela. We'd work all night, and then we would drive, follow one another over to American Fitness Center. We would go in, do a couple of laps around the, you know, the running area there, kind of get loosened up. 
And then we would hit the weights. And that, you know, day, that word days, Miss Sandy, I loved it. I loved it. I loved pumping the iron, you know. But then there were some days that I hated it. And with every push of the barbell when I was laying on the bench, I was like, I hate this. I'm going to stop. I'm going to hate it. I hate it. I'm going to stop. You know, but I had to keep doing it to get strong. You know, nobody ever told me when I signed up it was going to be easy to get muscles. You know, they didn't lie to me. They said, you know, if you want to get anything out of this membership, you're going to have to put something into it. Y'all, I had to endure. And because I did endure, I gained strength through adversity. And the adversity there was weights. You know, hey, it's the same with the guitar, man. There's days you want to play, days you don't want to. You got to push through. Same with the piano, the drums, whatever. There's days you love it, days you hate it. You got to endure. And you know why you do? It's because you want to be the best you can possibly be. So we got to endure in our walk with the Lord. Now, this was interesting to me. When Paul said, you got to endure as a good soldier, I thought immediately he was talking about a soldier that's out on the battlefield with bombs blowing up and bullets zipping over their head. But Paul is not referring to that. He was referring to the daily grind that soldiers had to go through, just like you were in boot camp. You know, every day from his prison window, again, he had first class, uh, first uh, you know, eye experience of it. He would watch these soldiers who day after day had to march, and then they had to march some more. These guys who had to drill and then drill some more. These guys who learned how to do hand-to-hand -hand combat. Guys who learned how to use a sword, learn how to defend with a shield. How they learned how to shoot a machine gun. They didn't have machine guns then. just want to see if you're even listening. <laughs> hey, speaking of machine guns, y'all ever checked out the Dragon Man? Elliot and I were watching a video of him last night. I want to go see the guy. But anyway... The day-to-day -day grind is what Paul was emphasizing to Timothy. You know, he said, in Timothy, in the day-to-day -day grind of the faith, you got to endure. Because as you endure, as you keep going when you don't want to, your faith is just like a muscle. It'll get stronger. Everybody say endure. endure. I tell you right here, I'll be honest with you for a minute. I had like two pages of biblically how to endure. And I was at work Friday, and I was like, most of them don't care nothing about that. Let's get real. What was Paul talking about? Again, when I realized Thursday when I was studying, he meant it was just the daily grind of a soldier. I don't know about y'all, but in my day-to-day -day walk with Christ, it is tough. Where it's especially tough when, you know, I work somewhere where almost everybody around me is dropping the F-bomb every other word. They're using the Lord's name in vain on a continual basis. They're talking about partying on the weekend, sleeping in on Sunday. Man, wouldn't that be nice, you know? Never going to church, and they're always the ones that got the, they drive the biggest four-wheel drive trucks into work. They got the sharpest little Miata in the parking lot, you know? And I'm watching these people. And I'm like, they don't care nothing about God or the things of God. And man, I'm trying to keep my testimony straight with them. I'm trying to keep my walk right with the Lord. And then I got to thinking, this is what Paul is talking about. That we have got to endure. When we look around at the world and it seems like they're winning and we're losing. Paul says, endure. Keep on keeping on in your faith. Because ultimately, we know who's going to win the final battle. Amen? You know, the final battle is recorded in the book of Revelation, and we're going to be on the winning side. So for right now, as a good soldier, we have just got to endure. And in the day-to-day -day grind of life, man, we've got to keep the faith. We've got to keep the faith. You know, sometimes we want to give up. We think, God, look at all I'm having to do for you. Man, once again, the Lord reminded me of a song, Dennis, from, you know, you think, who knows, years from now, I think Elliot's asleep over there, which he probably is, but years from now, he's going to say, you know, I remember Bob saying something in church one time. 
You know, I used to sleep in church, draw in church, talk in church, do everything but listen in church, but this stuff was going in my head without me knowing it. Because when I think about, God, look at all I'm doing for you. This song came to my mind, Dennis, the other day. And I don't, I can't remember the title of it, but it goes like this. Thinking about how much we do for the Lord. I traveled down a lonely road and no one seemed to care. The burden on my weary back had bowed me to despair. I oft complained to Jesus how folks were treating me. And then I heard him say so tenderly, My feet were also weary upon the Calvary road. And the cross became so heavy that I fell beneath the load. So you be faithful, weary pilgrim, because the morning I can see. Just lift your cross and follow close to me. The second verse. I'm, I'm coming this close, man, to singing it, but I'm not going to. I work so hard. Yeah, thank you. I work so hard for Jesus. I often boast and say, I've sacrificed a lot of things to walk the narrow way. I gave up fame and fortune. I'm worth a lot to thee. And then I hear him say so tenderly, I left the throne of glory and counted it but loss. And my hands were nailed in anger upon the cruel cross. Hey, but now we'll make the journey with your hands safe in mine. Just lift your cross and follow close to me. Hey, friends, look, Jesus endured for us. Paul endured many things. For the sake of time, I won't read them all, but I'd encourage you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 22 through 27. See the crazy things Paul endured for the faith, and then see if yours and mine little minuscule troubles come close to comparing. Number one, a good soldier has got to what? He's got to endure. Number two, a good soldier doesn't get entangled. Paul said that there in verse four. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself in the affairs of this life. You know, when y'all are soldiers, there's some things y'all can't do that us ordinary civilians can you know, we can go where we want. You go where your T.I. says to go. You know, you, we do what we want. You do what your drill, instru drill instructor tells you to do. Therefore, as a good soldier, you can't get caught up in things that don't matter to your service. You know, John MacArthur, again, he said this, thinking about being entangled. He said, a soldier is a soldier 24 hours a day, every day of the year. Hey, you know, and that's true, whether on active duty or on time off, a soldier is always a soldier, and the way that he or she acts is a reflection on the branch of the service that they're in. In his commentary on Timothy, as I was studying this week, uh, John Phillips, he's a pastor and theologian, he wrote this. He reflected on his time in the British Army, in the British Army. He said that when he enlisted, see if this is y'all's story, when he was enlisted, he was given a uniform, a mess kit, and a gun. He said the next day he was given a cardboard box, and in it he was to put all his civilian clothes and any belongings that he had, and he was told that these things were going to be shipped back home. And he said that as he handed that box to the mail person, whatever they call him, in the, he said as the mail person took that box from him, he said it hit him like a load of bricks. He said, hey, I'm in the army now. I can't go where I want to go. I can't do what I want to do. I'm going to be told this and I'm going to be told that and I must do it because I have given control of that to the service. And he said, therefore, whatever I do, it must be proper, it must be moral, it must be upstanding. I've never wanted to bring disgrace on my uniform. He said, because now I represent the queen. Hey, you know, maybe you never realized it before, brother and sister, but as a Christian, we can't just act as we want to. We can't just live as we wish. 
Because we're not our own commander. The Bible says that. You're no longer your own. You've been bought with a price. And what is that price? The precious blood of Jesus Christ. So therefore, Paul, again, saying it there. He said, we can't act as we want. We are now Jesus Christ. When we became a follower of His, we gave Him control of our life. Hey, but again, just as the word endure, it didn't mean anything that I thought it meant. This word entangle, this was most interesting learning this as well. Yeah, and I know some of y'all, it was so windy, you probably thought this thing blew in the door today. But uh, what is this thing? Yeah, who said Michelle said it? Yeah, it's the makings of a tumbleweed. Wow. Let me put this thing back down right here because uh, they're very sticky. Hey, uh, Elliot and Einstein and I, when we first started our little trek, daily trek on our dirt trail over there where we live, we had never seen these things. So our first experience with them was less than pleasant. And for whatever reason, Einstein, the dog, he always wanted to push up into the bush smelling for something. Well, you know what happens when he pushes up into the bush with his long hair? He gets caught up in it. He can't get out of it. Elliot's not going to mess with it. So that leaves it up to me. So to get him out of the bush, I get stuck. I get cut. I get bloody. I mean, what a sight. Einstein and I were as we became entangled in the bush. And y'all, this is what was so cool. This word entangle, everybody say entangle. entangle. The word Paul used in English, entangle, it literally means to weave together. Peter used the same word in his letter when he talked about the ladies that weaved their hair together. You and I, most of us, mean we got no trouble weaving our hair together. But anyway... The word, it means to weave together. And it was used of a sheep that would get entangled, caught up in a thorn bush. You see, as the sheep, all they do, you know, they just wander about continuously. They're always looking for food. And they would often find it growing around or under a thorn bush. And with that thick wool sticking out, they didn't feel the bush so they would push their way into it to keep eating the grass. And then when they try to back out, guess what? They are stuck because they have become entangled. Therefore, somebody else had to get them out. Well, friends, Paul gave such a word picture again to his readers. He used this word because they would know exactly what he's talking about. He used it to illustrate to a Christian what happens to a Christian when he or she wanders off from their commitment to Christ? And if we don't make a conscious, a conscious, I can't talk today, man. If we don't make a conscious, determined effort every day, everybody say every day. Amen. If we don't make an effort every day to follow our Lord and try to please Him, we can so easily get entangled in the affairs of this life that don't mean anything. So just like I wanted to know what Paul was talking about, endure, the daily grind. He said, don't get entangled in the affairs of this life. Hey, man, I wanted to know, what are you talking about, Paul? Are you talking about going out, getting wasted, getting drunk? You know, is that what you're talking about? Becoming entangled in the affairs of life? And that's not what Paul is talking about. Man, what he's talking about here is becoming too involved in anything, whether it be politics, sports, education, cars, gardening, entertainment, even getting too caught up in the weather. You know, all these things and many more like them in and of themselves are not evil. But when they take precedence over our time with the Lord, then guess what they have become? They become an idol and we become too entangled. I tell you, as I kept trying to determine what Paul was talking about, being entangled, I think I found it in a quote by Thomas Guthrie. Mr. Guthrie was a popular preacher back in Scotland in the mid-1800s. He said this, thinking about becoming entangled in the things of this world. He said, quote, If you find yourself loving any pleasure better than your prayers, any book better than your Bible, any house more than the house of the Lord, or any indulgence more than the hope of heaven? He said, then be alarmed, because you have become entangled. 
So what do we really spend our time and effort on? Is it on the things of the Lord or is it on things of the world, whether they really be evil or not? Because if they take more time than the Lord, we become entangled. Hey, so a good soldier, we do what? We endure, right? Everybody say endure. Endure. You ain't, nobody, you ain't doing nothing. Shake your fist and say endure. 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 A good soldier doesn't get entangled. And number three, a good soldier does encourage. You know, Brother Terry mentioned, you know, making, uh, making friends in the service, being able to count on somebody else. I can't imagine how soldiers have each other's back, you know, particularly in battle. Thinking about that, Encouraging one another as soldiers. In his book, Illustrations Unlimited, a favorite of many preachers. That was before Google came out, though. But anyway, James Hewitt, he wrote the following incident, wrote about the following incident, supposedly from the war in Vietnam. He said it was in the midst of a terrible battle. Two good friends became separated in the fighting. The fighting had gone on for a while when suddenly one of the friends noticed his other friend was wounded and lay out in the wide open of the battlefield. He couldn't get up to safety. So this guy goes over to his lieutenant. He said, sir, permission granted, whatever they say, permission requested. Permission requested to go get my friend. The lieutenant said, permission denied. Your friend's probably dead, and you would be killed in the process. Get back to fighting. So he resumes fighting. It's not long, and the lieutenant looks the other way. When he looked the other way, the guy saw it. He said, I don't care if I'm disobeying. He took off to his friend. He got to where his friend was, knelt down beside him, spoke something to him, picked him up in his arms and turned and began to run back towards safety. As he ran back towards safety, a spray of bullets just plastered his whole backside. He gets back with his wounded friend and he falls down there with him. And the lieutenant walks up. First of all, he's ticked to the hilt. But secondly, he's also grief-stricken. He said, son, you disobeyed a direct order. He said, look, you have wasted yourself, your time. Your friend here is dead. All you did was go drag a dead body back here. And laying down there with his last words, he looked up and he said, Lieutenant, sir, it was not a waste. Because when I reached my friend, he was alive. And he looked up at me and he said, I knew you would come. I knew you'd come and get me. Man, that's what soldiers do for each other on the battlefield. They'll die for each other. And Paul said that's what we're supposed to do as the family of God. We're not supposed to kick each other when we're down. We're supposed to help each other up. You know, Paul was always, always encouraging all of his brothers and sisters in the faith. You read his 13 letters, and in all of them, he never has a pity party. Pity party. I almost said potty, didn't I? He never has a pity party for himself. He's always encouraging everybody that he writes to. And here, as he wrote to Timothy, this is, Second Timothy has been called Paul's last will and testament because he died right after it, but... Here he wrote to Timothy, and he is encouraging him. You see, there's something none of us biblical scholars know. I love to throw myself in there with that, Randy. But biblical scholars don't really know what Timothy was going through. But Paul at this time just kept writing him. Be strong. Be encouraged. Don't give up. Something was going on in his life, in Timothy's life, that he wanted to just flat give up. He wanted to quit being a minister of the gospel. He just wanted to say to heck with it and walk away from it all. Again, I wish we knew what it was. We don't know if it was a, a, an irate church member that he had, if it was a girlfriend that left him. Again, nobody knows, only speculation. 
But Paul writes to him and he says, Timothy, you can't give up. You know, oh, I just blew it, man. I was going to say, what did, what did Paul do? What did the crass old apostle, what did he write to Timothy when he heard he was discouraged? Did he scold the young guy? Did he say, Timothy, all the time I've sunk into you, you better not quit. Timothy, think about it. A lot of people are counting on you. You better keep going. No, instead he writes to Timothy and he says, my son. Again, the most affectionate term of endearment. He reminded Timothy how much he loved him. He reminded Timothy how he was there for him. And friends, again, that's what a good soldier of Jesus Christ does. When we find out that somebody else is hurting, we go to them. Well, now we've got to stay six feet away from them, but whatever, we encourage each other because we're good soldiers. So today, friend, are you a good soldier of Jesus Christ? First of all, are you a soldier of Jesus Christ? Have you been saved? Are you sure? And if you are saved, are you serious about living for the Lord? So this Wednesday, as we think about the veterans and the sacrifices they have made, think about the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made, and then think about the sacrifice that we will make for Him and for each other. Let's pray. Almighty God, boy, the Apostle Paul, he went through so much stuff, and I thank you, God, that you inspired him to write about it, to record it so that we would have it to learn from and to live by. So Lord, today, I ask you, God, to help us to consider these words and whatever it is we need to do with it. God, I pray you would help us to be not just a soldier of Jesus Christ, but a good soldier. And it's in his blessed and holy name I pray. Amen.